Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have a great show for you today. Rocky, who do we have? Well, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis will join us to weigh in on Biden's new bill, making it easier for the U.S. to send military equipment to Ukraine. And then Julia Manchester and Rachel Bovard will join as our rising panel. We'll discuss a new law in Florida establishing a statewide Victims of Communism Day. But first, today President Biden will speak at the White House to unveil new details about his plan to fight inflation. The move comes as gas prices are again spiking across the country, nearing all-time highs at an average of $4.33 a gallon, according to AAA. That's about 20 cents higher than prices one month ago and more than a dollar higher than this time last year. The White House has scrambled to regain control of the narrative on inflation comes as new CNN polling shows a majority of U.S. adults believe President Biden's policies have hurt the economy. And 8 and 10 say the government isn't doing enough to combat inflation. You know, I was listening to the radio on the way in, and they were talking about some of these economic trends. They were talking about the rising gas prices and how unprecedented it is. What was so interesting is the solutions presented had nothing to do with raising wages to keep up with the cost of inflation. It was all about how to, you know, manipulate the Fed in different ways to, you know, have this downstream effect, but the core issue that people couldn't actually pay to keep up with rising prices was never really addressed square on. And then all the people they interviewed, it was none of the folks that are actually struggling with the ongoing economic conditions. And I say that because when we're talking about these polls and this disconnect between what Joe Biden's doing and what he should be blamed for, what he is properly credited with and what he isn't. I think it's partly, the confusion is partly because the coverage is so attenuated from people's real life experiences. Well, right, and, and the rhetoric coming from, you know, not exactly Biden himself, I think Biden himself, we don't often hear a lot of very firm commitments, but about, you know, Ukraine, mm. about the idea that this is going to be a conflict to the very end. A, there's there's more open acknowledgement that this is a proxy war mm -hmm. and more saying the quiet part out loud that regime change and the end of the Putin regime is the actual goal. And look, I have made clear on the show, I would have no problem with Vladimir Putin losing his power as a result of this strife. But if that is our plan, then we are preparing for a very long uh, escalation. We're, we're preparing to send lots of money, lots of aid, lots of weapons to keep up these you know, various embargoes and things we've tried to impose on Russia that are killing us here at home. They're raising the price of everything, including oil, most notably, but everything else, too. And I don't, are the American people ready for that? Are they ready for this to go on for a long time because of this battle with Russia? It, that question has not been put to them. Mm -hmm. They're certainly, if that's what they they voted for, they they're not aware that they voted for that. Um, and that's it's there's a, some dishonesty about that being a major contributing factor and all, and something we're going to deal with for the foreseeable future unless there is a really different plan to handle Ukraine. Yeah, you're seeing this zero sum game of it all right mm -hmm. now when you see this newest plan for 30 odd. And, you know, an initial 30 odd billion to Ukraine being initially coupled with some COVID relief that then got stripped from the bill. Democrats saying, oh, well, we can't get this through at this time. We've got to really prioritize Ukraine. Talk about saying the quiet part out loud. We're going to prioritize Ukraine over domestic relief. Even people who are very loyal adherents to Joe Biden see that and say that is absolutely not what we voted for. If anything, you were the guy that was going to withdraw us mm -hmm. from some of these international conflicts. And now there's this incredible appetite for more. You saw him going down to uh, the, uh, the production plant, the weapons production plant last week and giving these speeches to the people who worked there and say, well, aren't you proud that we're supporting Ukraine when there's a complete <laughs> inattention to what's going on in the country? And I think he should not be surprised mm -hmm. when poll numbers continue to trend the way that they have. Right. And he was supposed to be the guy who was smarter than all this because he watched Obama get hoodwinked into staying in Afghanistan. He said, nope, nope, not me. Trump didn't get us out, even though he said he would. He got hoodwinked too. We're actually getting out. And then there's a new conflict. And it's like, oh, no, I take, yeah. we, have to, we have to be involved. So in other news on the economic front, even CNN slammed Biden after the president bragged about reducing the federal deficit last week. Fact checkers for the network say the president distorted reality by personally claiming responsibility for shrinking the deficit and attributed the decline to the expiration of pandemic spending. One economist told CNN that the claims are, quote, almost bizarro world and that the deficit would have fallen by much more had President Biden come to office and not done anything. Uh, I, a guy can dream. 
But, uh, Look, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know the CNN fact checkers are still alive. I, I worried uh, I worried something horrible had happened to them. That they had been, retired with They'd Trump. been uh, hiding underground or something. But no, they're still around. How about that? Look, this is fundamentally libertarian ideal side. <laughs> this is fundamentally the problem with trying to meet the right in their deficit hawkery. One, they never cared about the deficit hawkery. No, absolutely. To begin it's with. it's I mean, preposterous. They don't. Trump they and don't. his tax cuts and driving up the deficit. Bush and his tax cuts and driving up the deficit. This is what they do. They drive up the deficit, and then when a Democrat is in office, they rile against it. Democrats historically have brought down the deficit. This isn't, it, this isn't anything right. new. But when you're ostensibly on the left, and you are ostensibly believe in the power of government to help people in some of these broad, extremely popular social safety net programs and funding them and keeping people alive, especially in the middle of a pandemic and economic crisis. If you try to play the Republican game about deficits, you get caught in this kind of hypocrisy where, yes, you only have this. We're only bringing down deficits in part because your agenda failed, because you weren't right. able to pass the relief that, frankly, was very popular and that America's wa Americans wanted, because also the deficits don't matter. The country's bank account is not the same as your kitchen bank account. And you are further, furthermore, bolstering that perception of how the government budget works in a way that's going to ultimately hurt you down the line when you try to do anything. It, it is true that the Republicans believe in cutting taxes, not for everybody, a lot mm -hmm. of tax cuts for the rich, and then reckless spending. Mm -hmm. And Democrats do high taxes and reckless spending. <laughs> And what? so either way, you get reckless spending, which is a tax of its own kind. Look, I don't think that the extremely popular $2,000 checks, which many people thought were going to be recurring checks, were reckless spending. I don't think that the child care relief, the child tax credits that kept so many families afloat through the pandemic and long periods of unemployment were reckless spending. I don't think that funding Social Security and Medicare so people don't die in the streets in old age the way they used to in this country is reckless spending. You know, and so I think that we have to be really clear that we as a community, take advantage of these programs. And on a local level, the, the lot of people on the opposite side of the political spectrum for me are very excited about certain kinds of spendings when it comes to funding police departments and the like. So everyone just needs to be honest about the fact that they have their ideological priorities and that it's not about spending versus not spending. It's not about being pro-deficit or anti-deficit or pro-taxes or anti-taxes. It's people feel like money, their tax dollars, and the money that doesn't come from taxes because, again, that's how, not how we, the budget how, works. How about we cut the defense budget by 50 percent? I would be Eliminate thrilled. the Department of Education. Absolutely Eliminate not, the <laughs> FDA. Eliminate the CDC. <laughs> eliminate the TSA. Okay. Well... Apart from living in a salmonella fueled dreamscape that you want us to live in, I think most people believe that there there needs to be some regulations over the things that we eat and make and making sure that there, there's some some checks there. I'm actually going to talk about that on my radar today. It's a different radar for me, not a defense of uh, Elon Musk, not a cancel culture <laughs> radar. I've got uh, I've got an economic one. You'll be kind of. I'm interested looking in. forward to hearing yeah. how you're spreading your wings today, Robbie. All right, but we're not quite done with this block yet. Yesterday, the president touted new federal investment in high-speed internet as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Let's watch. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're delivering high-speed internet infrastructure to every part of the country. And I mean that literally, every part of the country. The bottom line is this. My top priority is fighting inflation and lowering prices for families and things they need. Today's announcement is going to give millions of families a little more, a little more breathing room help them pay their bills. Yeah, but look, I, I, I know there are different ideas about how this works. I have to think a massive new spending bill would itself possibly contribute to inflation. So that is how it has historically worked. I understand why that's maybe not the exact reason for the, inf the whole picture for why we have inflation right now. But massive new spending is not usually the way to deal with inflation. So economists across the political spectrum of pushed will admit that nobody understands exactly how to control inflation. That is the great story of America. And what happens when nobody understands something is that everybody weaponizes inflation to advance their own political agenda. If you think spending is bad, you'll say, right. no more spending. But as it's been explained to me by people like uh, Professor uh, Fidel Kaboob and you know um, Stephanie Kelston and people who you may or may not uh, subscribe to their beliefs ideologically is that inflation happens when money is spent into the economy, uh, put into the economy and not spent, not used, sitting around, sitting in savings accounts. When you actually spend money into the economy by paying people wages to do a job that needs to be done, it circulates in a way that doesn't cause that same buildup. So an infrastructure plan is exactly the kind of spending that you should put into effect when you need to increase wages, when you need to employ a population, and when you need to most principally provide internet 
a basic good at this point that's necessary for kids to go to school, for people to do their work, to live in parts of the country that frankly need more people to stay there instead of flocking to cities. You don't have that unless you invest in it. This is, it's like saying, well, giving people medical services is gonna increase inflation. Even if it, even if that were the case, right. you would need to do it because it's just a basic, a basic human need at this point. Right, but the, the other idea being that you put more money out there into the economy than the providers of goods say, well, there's more money out there. We can raise prices a little bit because people have more money to spend. Raise prices on roads and bridges and sewer no, on, system on goods, and electric lines and well, no, that's but this is well this and is you know and how much they, well how much they charge for some of that stuff. Um, I think the number one thing the government could do is like just get out of the. There's a lot of getting out of the way they could still do on infrastructure, Robbie. You're really going to make the libertarian case if there's ever a case to be made for the federal government. The there's whole point so, of the federal there's government. There's red tape that goes into building stuff. Right, but the, absolutely no the housing. Our highway, housing problem uh, crisis right. is entirely one of government policy that we're, restricts where you can build. We're things. talking about. Broadband internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Build country. your roads, do your internet. Project, that's fine. Which is very that's fine. That's it's fine. also very popular among conservatives. So I think this is one that I would appreciate some follow through from, from Biden. That's fine. Oh. That should be uncontroversial. Have your roads, have your internet. <laughs> All right. I'm eager to get to my radar, which is coming up next.